All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. So today, I'm actually going to be asking you a lot of questions. And I'm always going to give you three options, three things that you can say. So and so that we're not constantly messing with mute. Um, I want you to give me I'll always ask a true false question. So I want you to give me a thumbs up if you think what I said is true. And then a thumbs down if you think what I said is false. And then you can also do a thumb in the middle for unsure. Because in science, it is perfectly fine to not be sure what the answer is. That's why we do science. And also, don't be afraid about being yes or no and being wrong, because scientists are all about being wrong. It can sometimes be a little frustrating when we do something wrong, but usually when we get something wrong is also right at the time when we're about to discover something really cool. So it is okay to be wrong and it is okay to not know. So yes, that sounds right. No, that sounds wrong. Or I don't really know. We all got that? Yeah? Okay. So um, this is, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here, there it is. All right, so I like to call this talk Interstellar Illusions. Does anyone, we know what an illusion is, right? I have a magician here. And when someone does magic, like if they make something disappear, they didn't really make it disappear, but they made it look like it disappeared. That's called an illusion. When something looks one way, but, but it, it really is another way. So that's what an illusion is. And there are a lot of illusions in space. So here is your first question. And for this one, you don't need any, um, you don't need any of your materials, any of your, your stuff that you gathered. You're just gonna need your hands. So I'm gonna ask a question. When we look up into the sky, right? We see, at night we see the moon. And in the daytime, we have the sunlight. We don't look directly at the sun without special glasses. But if you've ever seen an eclipse or pictures of an eclipse, we see that the moon passes right in front of the sun and blocks it. And it appears to just fit to cover the sun. So my question to you, are the sun and the moon the same size? because this picture sure makes it look like they are. So I want everyone to either give me a thumbs up if they think they're the same size, thumbs down if you don't think, if you think they're different sizes, or thumb in the middle if you're not really sure. So let's see everyone's thumbs. What do we got? I see two thumbs up down there. I see another thumbs up and thumbs up. All right, so the key thing here is that sometimes the answer is sort of. So in this case, yeah, we see right in this picture that they definitely look like they're the same size. And so there's something called uh, um, the appearance, right, the size. So they certainly seem like they are the same size. Now we're going to do the activity. And so what I want everyone to do is I want in one hand for you to make a fist, and in the other hand, go ahead and give a thumbs up. So I want to see everyone's fist and thumb in front of your face. Everyone got their fist and their thumb? Yeah. Now, clearly, my fist is bigger than my thumb, right? That, that's definitely true. So if I put the two, if I put my thumb in front of my fist, yeah, I can clearly see that the thumb is smaller than the fist. But that's because my thumb and the fist are the same distance from my eyes. So now what I want you to do is I want you to take that fist and I want you to move it all the way. I want you to straighten your arm all the way out far away from you. And then I want you to take your thumb and kind of close one eye. And I want you to put that thumb really, really close to your eye. And then try to block your fist with your thumb. Move that thumb right in front of your fist. And everyone should see that if your thumb is close enough, your thumb blocks your whole fist. So right there is an example of two things that are clearly not the same size, but when we put them at different distances, one can look bigger than the other. And if you move your thumb back and forth, like you're playing a trombone, try and see if you can get it to where your thumb and your fist look like they're exactly the same size. 
All right, play around with it and get it to where, oh, right there, for me at least, my thumb just barely can cover my fist. All right, so everyone seen that? Yeah. So what's going on here is that the moon is actually much, 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 much smaller than the sun. 400 times narrower than the sun. But the sun is also way farther away than the moon. So that's what's going on here. It's like the fist and the thumb. This is the moon and this is the sun and the sun's far away and the moon is close and they can line up and look like they're the same size, but actually they're very different. Now, one more thing I want you to do, go back to your fist and your thumb, and we all found that nice spot where the thumb just barely covered the fist. Be there, and now I want you to move your thumb a little farther away. And everyone sees that now the thumb doesn't quite cover the fist, right? We can still see a little bit of your fist. That actually can happen with the sun and moon as well, because the moon is not always the same distance from the earth. It's sometimes a little closer and sometimes a little farther. And sometimes when it's far from the earth and there's an eclipse, you get a very different kind of eclipse. This is called an annular eclipse. And what we see here is the moon looks a little smaller and does not quite cover the whole sun. So right there we can see, ah, no, they're not exactly the same size, and clearly it has to do with the distance. And just to let you know, we're not the only planet that gets these eclipses, because Mars gets eclipses too. Here is a picture from the surface of Mars, taken by one of our rover, rovers, of Mars's larger moon Phobos eclipsing the sun. And we can see here that Phobos is actually really small, but it's also really close to Mars, so it can block a good portion of the sun. The smaller moon Deimos is smaller and farther away, so it only blocks a little bit of the sun. So those are solar eclipses from Mars. Mars never gets a total solar eclipse, right, like we get on here on Earth. Now, as far as why do they appear to be almost exactly the same size, it's pure chance. The moon has not always been uh, where it is. The moon started out much, much closer to the Earth. And the moon is slowly moving away from the Earth, about one thumb's worth every year. So don't worry, we're not going to lose the moon anytime soon. But this means that we're just kind of lucky enough to be alive right now, to see these special things where they seem about the same size. And so when they line up, we see cool things like total solar eclipses. All right, so I'll ask again, as far as the actual objects, is, are they the same size? Yes, they're the same size. No, they're not, or I'm still not sure. I'm seeing a thumbs down there. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs not sure. Okay, so what we learned here is that they look like they're the same size, they are the same size in the sky, but they are not the same size if we were to look at them as two objects floating around in space. All right, questions on the sizes of the moon and the sun. Oh, I see a hand up. Charlotte or Reagan, I'm not sure who's who. Do you have a question? I saw a hand was up. No, that's okay. If you decide you have a question later, you can always jump back in or you can type it into the chat. All right, very good. All right, for our next activity, what I want you to have handy is I told you to find two things, one that's white and one that's yellow. All right, so let's make sure we've got those handy and raise your hand if you've ever heard an astronomer say, or you've ever read in a book, that the sun is a yellow star. Ra just raise your hand if you have heard someone say that the sun is a yellow star. Anyone heard that? Yeah, you see it in books all the time. And as scientists are concerned, that is true. So now I got another slightly different question for you. 
is the sun yellow? Or more specifically, is sunlight yellow? All right, so here's where you gotta vote. Give me a thumbs up if you think sunlight is yellow, thumbs down if you think sunlight is not yellow, or thumb in between if you're not really sure. So is the sun yellow, is sunlight yellow? All right, so let's talk about this. So this is what I like to do, this is science. I'm going to show you evidence, right? That means I'm gonna show you things that will either help you decide whether or not this is true. So first of all, right, every kid, if you ask them to draw a sun, draws this, something that looks like this, right? How many of you have drawn a picture of the sun that looks like this? Yeah, all right. So, and why do we do that? Well, probably because you saw someone else do it, but all right, so clearly we all draw the sun as yellow. Um, and here's a picture looking at the sun near sunset. And we all know at sunset, right? It looks kind of yellowy, orangey color, right? This is one of those times where it, the sun doesn't seem as bright. It's coming through a lot more air. And we've all seen this, right? This looks pretty yellow. And also, if you look at NASA pictures, right? We have satellites in orbit that are studying the sun. A lot of the pictures you'll see look like that when they show a picture of the sun. So, this sure looks like evidence that the sun is yellow. And again, we hear scientists tell us that it's a yellow star. Okay, but science is all about trying to see if we can find evidence against something, right? Stuff that says that that's not true. So now I'm gonna show you another set of pictures. Now here's a picture of the sun in the middle of the day. And if we look at the center where the sun is, it looks kind of white. And those clouds are really white. And if we look at a time where the snow is nice and fresh on that winter morning, the snow is very white, right? And when it's raining and we see a rainbow, we don't just see yellow, we see all the colors. And a rainbow is just taking sunlight and spreading it out into all the colors that it's made of. Okay, hold on here, what's going on? This is where I want you guys, I know it's a cloudy day, but the sun is still out and there still is sunlight. So it looks like everyone's got some natural light coming through their window. I have two pieces of paper. And one piece of paper is yellow and one piece of paper is white. And so I want everyone to kind of look at your yellow and your white objects. Think carefully about this. So the first thing I want to ask you and I have you think about is which one of these looks brighter, right? These, you're seeing these because they are reflecting sunlight. Sunlight is hitting these and bouncing off of it and coming into your eyes. So think about which one looks like it's reflecting more light and is brighter to your eyes. And now I also want you to think about the fact that if the sun was yellow, then wouldn't everything look like your yellow thing, right? If I were to shine yellow light on this piece of white paper, and if you've done that exercise at the Science Center with the projected lights, you've seen this, then this piece of paper should also look yellow, shouldn't it? So what's going on here? So everything I just showed you seems to say that sunlight is not just yellow, that it has all the colors in it, and that means it's white. So I'm gonna ask this question again. Again, don't be afraid to answer whatever you want. I'm gonna ask again, do you think sunlight is yellow? Give me a thumbs up if you think yes it is, or a thumbs down if you don't think it's yellow, or in between if you're really at this point kind of like, I don't know, you've shown me both ways. All right, I'm seeing some down arrows. All right, so now we're gonna dive into some serious science. And don't worry, you'll be able to understand it because you're really smart kids, I know you are. You're science fans. So, this shows and I'm gonna use my cursor here. This is a graph, and the only thing you need to know is that the higher that orange line gets, the more light it is coming from the sun. And here we see, sure enough, there's less red and less purple than in the middle of the rainbow, but 
things are getting any more confusing because this graph seems to say that the sun puts out more green light than the other colors, right? Green is the highest one here. So does that mean the sun is green? Things are just getting more confusing. What's going on? Well, it turns out that this graph is actually not that good because this is not how our eyes see light. So I'm going to put another graph up here. And again, what I want you to focus on is this orangey yellow line right here. This actually shows how our eyes see light. So again, higher up means more light. Now we see, yes, it is highest right here in green, but it's only a little lower in purple and only a little lower in red. So yeah, there is a tiny bit more green light coming from the sun than the other colors. But what we see is this is actually pretty flat, right? Look at all this light. This is not a big difference we're seeing here. So here's the answer to the question. The sun does put out more green light than other colors, but the difference is so small that our eyes basically see white because all the colors combined make white. And that's why a rainbow has all its colors. That's why white paper and snow look white. Uh, that's why today on this cloudy day, even we can really see, right, it, you know, things are all different colors, right? So the sun actually puts out all colors. Now this comes back to why then do scientists say that the sun is a yellow star? It has to do with the temperature of the sun. Instead of breaking things up into all these colors, this graph shows that when you have something down here, a cool star, these are colder stars, they tend to put out a lot more red and very little other colors. So they look very red. As they warm up, they kind of start to look very orangey and then they do look yellowy, but once they get up to the temperature of the sun, they basically look white. If we go past that to a really, really hot star like this one up here, now we see they put out a lot more purple and blue light than they do red and they start to look kind of whitish blue. So astronomers break things down into three categories, and stars that are red and orange we call red dwarfs. Stars that are, you know, whitish yellow to white we call, sorry, yellow stars. And stars that start to look kind of bluish white we call blue stars. So it's really just a nice easy way of dividing stars into three categories. But it does get confusing that you say the sun is yellow, but it puts out more green light, but essentially looks white to us. So the answer to this is kind of all over the map. Yes, it's a yellow star. Yes, it puts out more green light than any other color. And yes, sunlight is white. So it's kind of all of the above. Okay, now for our next activity. Okay, oh, any questions about sunlight? Any questions about what color? the sun is. So Are I would you all you still going to draw your sun as yellow, you think? Or so do you think I, you'll try drawing it a different color? You know, I think it's really hard. We usually draw on white paper, which makes it really hard to draw a white sun. But I'm sure you guys have been in art class and you're told fill the whole paper. So if you wanted to, you could fill a whole paper with the blue sky and then leave an empty space for a white sun. Or hey, you could even be a little crazy. You could draw a green sun and say, hey, I know that actually the sun, it puts out more green light than anything else and really freak people out. <laughs> so I would say that if you're drawing the sun, white or slightly green would be a cool thing to draw. And that gets people asking, why did you draw a green sun? And you can tell them, because Space Lady Zoe told me, that there's more green light coming from the sun than any other color, but it pretty much looks white. All right, so uh, next activity, the things I want you to have handy are your two objects that are kind of made of the same thing. Again, I chose two batteries. It's made of the same thing, but they're different sizes and one is much heavier than the other one. All right, I see two different balls, right? All right, so we want two things that are kind of heavy, but they're different sizes and one feels heavier than the other one. And also either a pillow or you guys look like you're on your couch cushions um, because we are gonna drop things. And if like me, you've got wood floors, I don't want anyone to hurt their floor. 
So if you've got carpet, then you're fine. Okay, so here's the question that I'm gonna ask you, and you've probably heard someone say this, talk about this. Is there gravity in space? Hmm. All right, so thumbs up if you think there is gravity in space, thumbs down if you think there's no gravity in space, and thumbs sideways if you're not sure if there's gravity in space or not. So gravity in space, no gravity in space, not sure. Okay, I love this. I'm seeing some thumbs up, some thumbs down. That's awesome. That's science. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. Again, may I present the evidence? Here we see an astronaut floating in space. They're not falling, right? They're, they're just there. And if you're not falling, right, gravity makes you fall. So if they're not falling, that seems like they don't have any gravity. Here we go. These are astronauts playing a little game of ball on the International Space Station. And they're floating around. They're not standing on any particular surface. They're not falling. They're floating. So that, again, sure looks like they don't have any gravity to pull them to any floor, right? There is no floor or ceiling on the space station, right? Everything's just a wall. All right, so that is one thing to look at. Now, here is where I'm gonna put up something slightly different, though. Here is famous skateboarder, world-class champion skateboarder, Tony Hawk doing tricks on his skateboard in what looks like he must be in space. But guess what? Tony Hawk has never been to space. So how is he doing this? We don't have like anti-gravity fields at science fiction. Tony Hawk's in an airplane. It's not in space. So does that mean but there's no gravity on airplanes? Um, if you've been on an airplane, you know there's definitely gravity, right? If you jump on an airplane, you'll go back down to the floor. You can walk around. You don't float up out of your seat when you take your seatbelt off, all right? So there's clearly gravity where Tony Hawk is, but he's floating. So what's going on here? All right, now is when I want you to think carefully about what you're feeling right now you're sitting there or you're standing there, you are not falling, are you? Right? None of you are falling. And what's happening is the earth or the couch that's on the earth or your floor that's on the earth is holding you up and keeping you from falling. And that's kind of what gives you a feeling of weight, right? The, the earth is pushing back on you to keep you from falling. And guess what? You are pushing back on the earth just as strong. The difference is, of course, that the Earth is enormous and your tiny little push doesn't do a whole lot to it. All right, so you do not feel weightless right now. You feel your weight, right? But when you see people floating around, that's what we call weightlessness, right? No weight, because nothing, they're not falling, so nothing needs to stop them from falling. All right, now we're gonna get our objects and we're gonna do the famous experiment that has been done for hundreds of years. Galileo is famous for this experiment. If I were to drop this battery and a feather, would they fall and hit the ground at the same time? No? No? Which one would hit first? Would the feather hit or would the, the battery hit? Give me a thumbs up for feather would hit the ground first and fall faster, thumbs down if you think the battery would fall faster and hit the ground first. I see a thumbs down, all right. And you're absolutely right, it would. But that has more to do with the fact that the feather catches the air on the way down. It's being pushed by the air, that's how birds fly. But if you have two things that are kind of the same shape, made of the same stuff, but one is heavier than the other, holding your objects, all right, which one do you, okay, here's the question for you. Do you think that the heavy one is gonna hit the ground first? Or will the lighter one hit the ground first? Or 
Will they hit at the same time? So I want to see a thumbs up for the heavy ones going to hit first. Thumbs down for the light ones going to hit first. And in the middle, if you think they'll hit the ground at the same time. Give me your vote. Heavy is going to hit first and fall faster. Light's going to hit the ground faster. Or they're both going to go down at the same time. What do you guys think? Does anyone want to share what objects they have? I yeah, think, I like those things. Carolyn and Reagan, do you have some different size balls? Yeah, you got yeah. those? Cool. Uh, Karen, Corinne, do you have any objects you're going to use to test? You're not sure? That is totally OK. It's fine. You can also do this later uh, on, on your own. So the thing to do is to, over a surface that's soft, right? to hold out your two objects and as hold them at the same height and as best you can make sure they've got a clear path down to the floor they're not going to hit anything and then drop them both at the same time all right in science we always do things again to check so i want everyone to do it again and this time try holding them up nice and high and watching kind of the ground to see and drop them. All right, so um, I did this earlier and I can tell you that my batteries seem to both hit my pillow at the same time. Anyone else finding that they're hitting the ground at the same time? Yeah, okay. So this was a big discovery in science, the fact that actually everything falls at the same rate except for when you're running into the air like a feather does. So the reason a feather falls slow is not because it doesn't weigh very much, it falls slow because it's designed to catch the air and have the air hold it up. So what they did, the astronauts that went to the moon, they took with them hammers of course to hammer at the rocks, but one of them also took a feather. That's right, they took a feather to the moon. On the moon there's no air. There's gravity, that's how they're able to walk around and jump and fall, but there's no air on the moon. And so they held out a feather and a hammer, and they let go, and they both went down and hit the ground at the exact same time. So this is what gravity does. So now your second experiment is, and mine are round and yours are round, so this might be a little hard, but if I want to put my light thing on top of my heavy thing, right? Just like you sitting on the couch, this little one is feeling a push, right? It's not falling, and it's feeling the push of the larger one holding it up and keeping it from falling. And the larger one, in turn, is feeling the weight of that smaller one sitting on top of it. But if I drop them both, and they're both falling at the same speed, then nobody is stopping anyone from falling. They're moving along with each other, both falling together at the same speed. And so there's no pushing, right? Nobody's running into anyone else. No one's stopping someone else from falling. They're both there. And that's why together, therefore, they seem like they are weightless, right? This big one now doesn't feel any weight from the little one when it's falling. So back to Mr. Tony Hawk here. What's happening here is that he's in an airplane and the airplane has turned off its engines and is falling on purpose. It's not, they're not crashing, they do this on purpose. They get up really high, they turn off the engines and the plane just falls. So the plane and Tony and his skateboard are all falling at exactly the same speed and therefore they all feel weightless, right? Nobody's pushing or stopping anybody from falling. They're all falling. Guess what? That is the exact same thing that's happening on the space station. The space station, the astronauts, that ball are all falling toward the Earth. And so none of them are pushing on each other. Okay, but wait a second. If they're falling toward the Earth, how are they staying up there? Let's imagine this. Now this, of course, the Earth is much, much bigger than a cannon, but imagine you have a cannon and it shoots a cannonball and it goes and it lands here. All right, but what if we shoot it with more power and it goes farther here? 
notice that it's following a curve, but the Earth is also round and curved. So we can imagine if we fired it fast enough, it would follow a curved path, but that curve would exactly match the curve of the Earth and it would never come down. It would be always falling, but never come down because as it fell, the Earth curves away from it. And that is what is going on with these astronauts. So astronauts actually still are in the gravity of the Earth. The gravity of the Earth is what is keeping the space station in orbit around Earth. If, it weren't, if there were no gravity, the space station would just float off into space. The gravity of the Earth is keeping the moon in orbit around us. This is why the moon doesn't just go flying off into space. So there is gravity in space, but if you're in orbit, which is a constant falling, then you feel weightless. So there's a difference between feeling weightless and there not being gravity. All right, so this is where we go wrong. People hear weightless and they think, well, if there's no weight, that must be because there's no gravity. There is gravity, but you can feel weightless if you just fall. And anyone who ever goes on a roller coaster might start to get this sensation two times. If you go on one of those that just kind of drops you, for a few seconds, you'll feel yourself float up in your chair. It's because you're falling at the same rate as your chair, and so neither of you is running into each other. Or on a roller coaster that goes up over a hill, when you get to the top of that hill, you'll feel like you float up in your chair, and that's because the roller coaster doesn't have any motor on it, right? It's just going along, and for that moment, you're like Tony Hawk. You and the chair are both going up and coming down the same, and so you and the chair aren't pushing on each other. So what gives us a sense of weight is really nothing more the, than the earth or a chair or a floor pushing back on us to keep us from falling. The minute we're falling, nothing pushing on anything else, and so we feel weightless. All right, so let's, anyone have questions about the difference between having gravity and being weightless. I think we're gonna wrap up in a second. Does anyone have any final questions about space or anything oh, you've yeah. learned today for Zoe? That is okay. Well, thank you all for joining us and thanks Zoe for running a really fun set of activities on space. We hope that you'll all join us what next Tuesday. Are you asking what we're doing next week, Trey? Yeah, cool. So next week, we're actually gonna do a different set of space activity. We're gonna do another space activity. Um, we're gonna to work together to practice how astronomers and space scientists look for planets far off in space. And I'll be running a fun activity for all of you. Um, and for that, you'll want a pen or a pencil, something to write with and a piece of paper, or we'll share some different worksheets that you can use because we're gonna make some observations and look at how we might be able to spot planets that are really, really, really far away and maybe discover some new planets together. All right. Well, thank you all again for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody. All right, bye, thank you.